Hi everyone, this is Mary Gregory with Mass Coding Solution. Welcome to our YouTube video today. Today we will be talking about or continuing a series that we began on preparing for the CCS review. Uh, and so today what we're going to talk about is how understanding that principal diagnosis and understanding about secondary diagnosis. So we're going to go through a few slides and we're going to talk about that. When you take the CCS, it's all about inpatient coding or facility-based coding. And the principal diagnosis in inpatient coding is so key. It's key to getting the proper reimbursement. It's key to keeping us out of audit trouble. And when you take the test, they are going to be testing your ability to select the principal diagnosis. Now you got to put on your critical thinking skills, okay? What we're going to do today is we're going to go through some of those guidelines that you have to be familiar with. If you're not familiar with these guidelines, if you're not practicing these guidelines, especially, you know, you may be a CDI person, you may uh, currently be working in a physician office, and you want to transition uh, into that facility-based coding or you, at this point in your life, you say, I want to get my CCS. And we all know that stands for Certified Coding Specialist. We know that that is a credential that is offered by AHIMA, the American Medical, uh, American, what? Health Information Management. American Health Information Management. Isn't that something? I'm about to forget what that all just stand for. But you know, we talk in acronyms so much, so sometimes you got to think about what is the acronym. Uh, but AHIMA is a very large organization, been around for uh, at least 100 years, uh, so uh, it has a rich uh, history, and so they are the ones that administer the CCS test. If you are thinking about the CCS test, I encourage you to go out to ahima.org, www.ahima.org. Uh, you click on certification and it will give you all the requirements to be uh, to set for this test. So today we're going to jump into understanding understanding the principal diagnosis and secondary diagnosis because when you take the test they're going to be testing you on that. They're going to be testing do you know when to select that principal diagnosis. Do you know when secondary diagnoses can be coded? So we just kind of give you some little uh, brief hints today. Uh, of course, this won't substitute for you studying. It will not substitute if you feel like you need to actually take a course. Uh, now, when we uh, give our CCS prep, we do not teach you how to code. When you come to us, you should know how to code. So I've seen courses out there where basically they're giving you a coding course. When you're taking a CCS prep, we are here to undergird you. We are here to remind you of things that you may have forgotten, or we're here to remind you about things that you have never coded. If you're an outpatient coder, then you probably have never really had to dig into uh, principal diagnosis and secondary diagnoses, but you, uh, you have a good understanding of the guidelines. You may, you already know how to find a code in the book, see. And so <clears throat> that's why our CCS prep, <coughs> excuse me, is generally on about two days. Uh, so, because we're not here to teach you uh, total coding, but we're here to undergird you. We're here to strengthen you in your abilities that you already have, okay? And to kind of to, like I said, if you're an outpatient coder, you never touch this that, of course, we want you to have a great understanding about uh, the CCS review and the diagnosis. Okay, let's get started. Okay, the first thing that you have to remember when you are taking this test, that they want you to be able to select the principal diagnosis. What is the definition of the principal diagnosis? That's very important. You have to understand what is that definition, and then you have to take that understanding and apply it to an everyday situation. Now, the one thing you always have to remember is that the circumstances of inpatient admission always govern the selection of the principal diagnosis. And you might say, Mary, what in the world does that mean? 
every time someone comes into the hospital as an inpatient, there are some circumstances that surrounds that. You know? uh, so those circumstances, we have to pay attention to them. Now, the definition, the principal diagnosis is defined in the UHDDS as that condition established after study to be chiefly responsible for occasion in the admission of the patient to the hospital for care. So when I want to select my principal diagnosis, let's say my patient coming in with congestive heart failure, they got a congestive heart failure, they may have pneumonia, maybe they got some end stage renal disease going on. I am going to have to say, okay, what are the circumstances? What's driving that patient to come to this facility? Well, with CHF, it could be shortness of breath, it could be edema. With the pneumonia, once again, it could be some of the same things, shortness of breath, cough, and a fever. Those are circumstances, see. And then I'm going to take that and say after study. Now, after study does not necessarily mean after you get into the hospital. See, in those circumstances, when that patient is in that physician office or that patient is in the ED, my circumstances or after study can be done in the ED. After they work that patient up in the emergency department, they say, oh my gosh, you got severe or acute systolic heart failure, you need to be admitted. Now those are my circumstances and that could be the driver. It's that condition established after study. Now sometime after study does mean you get them into the hospital, say. Maybe the patient is coming in with shortness of breath, preliminary edema is going on, and you got pneumonia and you got CHF. Now, I may have to look and see what was done for the CHF, what was done for the pneumonia, and I would make a decision after study, because now they had to get them into the hospital to determine that. So keep that in mind. When you're looking at those coded scenarios, and they are asking you about those principal diagnoses. Look in your scenario and say, okay, what are the circumstances and what is being treated? Let's move on. Selection of the principal diagnosis. Let's look at some of the guidelines that you got to be very familiar with. Now, these guidelines are uh, under the Freedom of Information Act. You can go out and Google ICD-10 official coding guidelines, and you're going to get these guidelines. Codes for symptom signs and ill-defined conditions. Codes for symptom signs and ill-defined conditions from Chapter 18 are not to be used as a principal diagnosis when a related definitive diagnosis has been established. That's a guideline. So when my patient come in with abdominal pain and they, dis they discover that they got appendicitis, after study they discovered they had appendicitis, abdominal pain, fever, a high WBC, is integral to appendicitis. Therefore, I'm not going to use those signs and symptoms as my principal. I'm going to use appendicitis. See? So you have to know that rule. You got to understand it. If you have contrast and comparative diagnosis, what are you going to do with your uh, contrast and comparative? How, how do I know something that's contrasting and comparative? Well, the physician is going to say something like pneumonia versus CHF. Or they can say uh, CHF versus GI bleed, uh, but you got that versus in there. Or you can have the word R. Uh, I got CHF or it could be pneumonia. Those are contrasting comparative. Well, the circumstances of the admission, so now I got both of these things going on at the same time, but the physician cannot decide which one. So I got comparative and contrasting. And you will see that in the real world of coding. What do I do with those? Well, what we're going to do, we're going to code them as if the diagnosis were confirmed. Always remember, with inpatient coding, uh, we can code as inpatient coders, rule out, well not rule out, but uh, not, you can do uh, questionable, possible, probable. Now if they say rude, R-U-L-E-D, if they say ruled out, then we cannot code that diagnosis. But if they're just saying they want to rule something out and they do not rule it out, then it's a codable diagnosis. But you always want to look at what was done for the diagnosis. So we'll talk about that. You're going to look at your clinical indicators. So you're going to code both of them as if they were confirmed. 
And most of the time they are confirmed. They just don't know which one they want to go with. And what can we do? You can, if there's no further determination can be made as to which diagnosis should be principal, either diagnosis may be sequenced pr at first. But once again, we're going to talk about how do you make that choice. How do I make the choice of which one is principal? And we're going to talk about that. Original treatment plan not carried out. If somebody come in, I had this many years ago, uh, a patient to come in for a transurethral resection of the prostate. Well, when, they got, when the patient got there, he mentioned to his surgeon, he said, you know, I've just been having this twinge of chest pain. And when you say that to a physician, a surgeon that's getting ready to operate on you, okay, everything going to come to a standstill. So they stopped and they gave him an EKG. And guess what? He had had an MI, a myocardial infarction. So they had to cancel that procedure. But guess what? Uh, BPH was still my principal diagnosis because that is what was causing that patient to come in. The MI, they discovered it afterwards. Now granted, the MI is going to be present on a mission with a POA or yes, but it wasn't the driver of your mission. So when somebody come in for something original, whether they're coming in, they may be coming in to have what they call an elective cholecystectomy. Uh, they're coming in for a transurethral resection of the prostate. They may be coming in for kidney stones. And they have to cancel that procedure. Well, your diagnosis, your principal diagnosis is still going to be the reason why they came in for the procedure. Just because the procedure got canceled don't mean that now you can make that your principal. Now, also, I always have to say this, there are always going to be exceptions. And me, that, what I mean by this is that sometimes before the patient get to, uh, before the patient is admitted, they will be down in the old, let's say they are uh, in outpatient, they're in the ED, and they say, well, you know, I was going to have the surgery done. And they say, oh, by the way, I've been having this chest pain. Well, if they get admitted from the ED for the chest pain to turn out to be MI, then MI, of course, can be your principal. We're talking about in those situations where we know that the patient has been admitted strictly for that procedure. See? And after they admit the patient for the procedure, that procedure has to be canceled. So you always have to kind of clarify and make sure everything looks okay. What about complication of surgery and other medical care? You got to know this rule. There are times when your patient is in outpatient uh, or complication of surgery or medical care. When the admission is for treatment of a complication resulting from surgery or other medical care, that complication is sequenced first. Complication do not mean that the physician did something wrong. But a lot of times that's what people think. But that's not what it means. Uh, your patient could have, uh, there are times when uh, a patient have had a procedure done and they said go, go home, stay off your feet, don't move nothing, don't pick up anything. And they'll pick up something, they'll disrupt the wound. It's called a wound dehance. So they disrupt the wound, the wound bursts open, that's a complication. Did the physician cause it? No, they did not cause that complication. So we have to think about that. Uncertain diagnosis or our suspected diagnosis. On inpatient, you can code a suspected diagnosis, but you gotta be careful with that. Always add this other part to it. Was it worked up? Was it treated? Because sometimes they'll work something up and they may treat that patient as if they have a pneumonia, but they may not really truly can prove that the patient have a pneumonia. So if that suspected condition is worked up, and treated, and or can be worked up or treated, worked up or treated, then we can code that. So be careful with that. If there's no treatment given, if the patient is on their way out the door, I've seen this a lot of times. Um, they have on discharge summary. Oh, by the way, I think this patient have a UTI. Well, the patient is on their way out the door. You didn't provide any treatment. You didn't provide any therapy. Well, before. You add that as a secondary diagnosis, you may want to confirm that with your super coding supervisor or something like that. Observation can be key. This is really a, a big area in the real life of coding. And you have to realize 
I don't know what you're going to get on the test. So you need to be prepared for anything. So, admission following medical observation, what does that mean? There are times when a patient is put in OBS. That patient is put in observation for, I don't know, let's say chest pain. They put them in observation for chest pain. That's a medical, you know, medical means you don't have any procedures. Now, always remember there are certain procedures that, um, let's see, they are procedure, but they're not considered to be surgical procedure, okay? There's a difference. You know, somebody can get an IV uh, shot, uh, IV fluids, or they can get an IV um, medication. They can get a shot. Of course, that's a procedure, but that's not considered to be a surgical procedure. So that could be a medical observation. So we know that we're talking about medical. So the patient is down in, uh, in the observation. And always remember, observation can be anywhere in the hospital. Observation is determined by the order, not by where the patient is placed in the hospital. Now you can use that one too on your CPC uh, certification if you decide to do CPC. Now, so my patient is in observation for chest pain. Chest pain is alleviated. And they discovered that the patient got an anemia uh, let's see, hemoglobin is five, and they said, we need to admit this patient for a blood transfusion. Now, my principal diagnosis is actually what necessitated the admission. Remember the circumstances of the admission? Remember after study? Well, after study and observation, they found out that the patient had an anemia and needed to be admitted for anemia, so anemia become my principal diagnosis. Now, of course, there are going to be times when your patient go from observation to an inpatient for the same diagnosis, and that's okay. What about post-operative observation? This one can be really tricky. Notice when a patient is admitted to an observation unit to monitor a condition or a complication that develops following outpatient surgery and then is subsequently admitted as an inpatient of the same hospital, the hospital have to apply that UADDS definition of the principal diagnosis. What was the condition established after study uh, to cause that patient to come to the hospital or to be admitted from outpatient surgery? So maybe the patient is having um, hemorrhaging. If that's true, the hemorrhage will become my principal diagnosis. Maybe the patient went into atrial fibrillation. If so, atrial fibrillation will become my principal diagnosis. Let's go to the next slide where it actually gives you a little bit more um, insight into this admission from outpatient surgery. Now make sure that you study this because this is in the official coding guidelines. Um, so if it's, it's a couple different uh, scenarios that could play out when you have a patient coming in from outpatient surgery. And so let's just talk about some of those scenarios. Sometimes that reason from the outpatient surgery can be a complication such as a hemorrhage, a post op fever, a post op alexis, see. And so in those cases, I'm going to have to use a uh, post op code. Now, be very careful with this, even in your real world of coding. The physician, the surgeon, always have to make a relationship between the complication and the procedure. Now there are certain things we know is a complication. If somebody is hemorrhaging blood from their incision, that's a complication. But if somebody has atrial fibrillation after they have a procedure, that is not necessarily a post-op atrial fibrillation. See, uh, that doesn't mean that the procedure caused that atrial fibrillation. The physician has to make that relationship for you. But if it is a, quote, complication, the complication would go first. Or, once again, it could be atrial fibrillation, maybe the back patient uh, hyper was hypertensive, their blood pressure went up. That's not a post-op complication. So you got to be careful with these complication codes, uh, especially now as we move forward in this value-based world where physicians are going to be getting paid for quality. We cannot be coding things as complications when they're not complications. Always remember from a physician perspective, uh, when they say complicate, when they say uh, post-op, they are simply talking about a period of time. They're not talking about that the procedure itself was a, uh, was a complication. They're just saying this is a time, this is a time frame. The patient is uh, in a post-op period. 
you know, you go have a, even a hernia repair, you're going to be post-op for several days. And so when the physicians see you, they may say, oh, Mary, you got a, a fever. You got a post-op fever. Well, that may be, he's just saying, you know, you're your post-op period and you got a fever. But it had nothing to do with the surgery. That fever could be coming from a pneumonia. That fever could, could, could be coming from a virus. So you, as a coder, you have to know when you need to ask the physician for that relationship. So study these things. If the reason for the inpatient visit is another condition like atrophy of hypertension, of course you're going to use it. Now this is very important. Sometimes patients are in outpatient, uh, have an outpatient procedure, especially our older patients. Um, they need a little bit more care than maybe somebody that's 25. I had a case one time, the patient had a very large inguinal hernia. And it took them longer than normal to repair that hernia. So the patient needed to go to the floor for a while. The patient needed to be admitted as an inpatient. There was no complication. They just needed to be observed longer. In that case, the inguinal hernia was still my principal diagnosis for my admission. See, don't be putting some crazy Z code on there. Z code for aftercare. No. When they come straight from outpatient surgery because they need more care related to that surgery, there's no complication, there's no other problem, then you code the reason for the surgery as your inpatient diagnosis. And I know some of you are probably shaking your hands, I never heard of that, that can't be true. I'm just telling you what the rules say. Read the rules and you'll be okay. Two or more. Now, remember when I was talking about uh, on the CCS, this slide and the next slide that I show you is huge. Uh, remember when we talked about the circumstances of the admission and we talked about after study and I gave you an example where a patient could have a congested heart, or acute systolic heart failure and a pneumonia. But let me do one where it said interrelated. Supposing your patient came in with acute congestive heart failure and atrial fibrillation. Both of these conditions are going on. And the physician might actually say that the heart failure is causing the atrial fibrillation. Or he might say the atrial fibrillation is causing the heart failure. They are interrelated. Okay? So they both meet the potentially for the principal diagnosis. So the rule is when there are two or more interrelated conditions, such as diseases in that, oh, I got to take out nine and put ten in here, chapter of manifestation, and both of them potentially meet the definition of the principal diagnosis. So that, C, uh, that CHF can meet the principal, and atrial fibril could be the principal. How can you decide which one to go with? Look at the circumstances of the admission, Look at the therapy provided. Look to see if you have a guideline in your tabular or if the alphabetical index indicates something. If you have a guideline, then you have to follow that guideline. If you do not have a guideline, so when you go to CHF, it doesn't say do the atrophib, code atrophib first. You go to atrophib and it doesn't say code CHF first. So there's no guideline even though they're related. What you're going to do, you're going to say, okay, what's the circumstances of admission? So the patient came in with shortness of breath. Both of these things are going on. Look at what was done. You have to look at what was done. And always remember this. I don't necessarily think it's true, but this is the way it kind of plays out. I, surgery rules, then IV therapy rules, and then oral medication is last. So if your patient get IV therapy for both of those conditions, then either one could be your principal. But if your patient get IV Lasix for his CHF and he get some type of oral medication for the atrophib, you better choose CHF as your principal because they see uh, that anytime you get IV Lasix versus or medication, they kind of see that as getting more treatment for that uh, CHF. So kind of just watch out. 
Many years ago, I was working with a nurse and we had a patient that had, uh, I think it may have had like a ventricular tachycardia or something like that. And that particular medication that he had to receive was a, it was an oral medication, but guess what? It could only be given in the hospital. And so that's why I'm always a little bit hesitant to say um, that IV always going to rule. But for testing purposes, IV rules, okay? So if they tell you that the patient got IV treatment for CHF and an oral medication for atrophip, you better choose CHF as your principal. If not, your paper is going to be marked wrong. All righty, so remember two or more interrelated conditions each potentially. See that word, potentially? <laughs> uh, meeting the definition for principal diagnosis. So they potentially. What you want to do is you always want to look at the circumstances of the admission. Which, was, which one really drove that patient to come in? You're going to look at your therapy. Remember, if one requires surgery and the other do not, they're both present on admission. Go with the one that requires the surgery as your principal. Uh, your therapy provided, once again, um, whether I like it or not, I do tend the rules, especially when auditors are coming in looking at your uh, work. Two or more diagnoses that equally meet the definition for principal diagnosis. These are two of the main ones that you kind of see on the test. You may get several questions where you're going to have to uh, select the correct principal diagnosis based on one of the previous rules interrelated and now two or more. So if there are times when two conditions are present and neither are, they're not interrelated. Let's say your patient came in with a hip fracture and a UTI. They both present on admission. They both could have caused the admission. Uh, and let's say the patient had a uh, ORIF, or open reduction with internal fixation device. Now, because that oh, uh, the hip fracture required a major surgery, you're going to want to go with that one first and then do the UTI uh, second. And maybe the next time we do this series, we'll talk about some chapter specific things. Okay? So, once again, circumstances of admission, diagnostic workup, and a therapy provided, and the alphabetical index always be guided by coding guidelines. You cannot supersede an official coding rule. We cannot uh, um, what, uh, supersede uh, a directive that we have gotten in the AHA coding clinic. So be careful, and you got to learn how to put those rules together. Know when I need to use this rule versus that rule. Uh, so two or more diagnoses that equally meet that definition. So once again, maybe you got a patient that got a pneumonia and the patient got a congested heart failure. Both of them present on admission. Both of them could, the circumstances of the admission that could govern that could be, both of them required that patient to come to the hospital. Let me um, give you an example of what something is present on a mission, but it didn't cause the mission. So you can have a patient, let's say your patient got end stage renal disease, and they have a, um, let's say, an acute fluid overload. You have a code in that I-10 book for fluid overload. Now, granted, that patient probably got fluid overload. They could have missed dialysis. They could have eaten some things they wasn't supposed to eat, caused them to have too much fluid. So, end-stage rent disease is present on a mission. But the circumstances that's causing that patient to come in is the fluid overload, even though it may be due to that end-stage rent disease. So when you go to fluid overload and you look that up, it doesn't say code first in stage renal disease. And because you don't have that, then you can't say, well, you know, this end stage renal disease is causing this fluid overload, they missed dialysis, I'm gonna go with that. You cannot do that, see. Because the circumstances of that omission was because of the fluid overload. So you gotta, you got to think these things through. Um, and that's what makes you a great coder. See, people don't pay you to put numbers on that paper. They pay you to think. They pay you to get them the best reimbursement within the law that they can keep. Because we get audited from everywhere now, people. 
So, but anyway, we're talking about the CCS. Sorry about that. So, two or more diagnoses that equally meet the definition. I always say to yourself, what was done for both conditions? If you need to, put one condition on a sheet of paper, write down what was done. Put the other condition on the other half, write down what was done. If more was done for that other one, if more was done for the pneumonia than the CHF, I'm going to have to go with pneumonia. Especially, you know, so if my patient got an acute CHF, got pneumonia, they put on the vent, oh my God, they put on the ventilator, I'm going with pneumonia, see. Because the ventilator is greater than IV fluids. And that's what they get, that's what, that's, that's what they paying you to just do. They, they paying you to think like that. Everybody wants to be a coder today, but nobody's willing to pay the price to pay that you have to pay to be a great coder. And so you don't have to pay that price. Some of you are going to say, I'm not going to listen to this lady again. Um, that was principal diagnosis. So we're about to wrap this up. Uh, UHDDS item 11B says, and it defines other diagnoses. We call them secondary diagnosis. But in order to code all diagnoses that coexist at the time of admission that could affect the care of the patient can be coded. Now, what's the definition? They said all conditions that coexist at the time of admission that the, or it could develop after admission but it affects the treatment received and or the length of stay. And you might say, well, Mary, how do you determine that? Glad you asked that question, because they tell you how to do it. If you want to code an additional diagnosis, always ask yourself, was there any type of clinical evaluation? Was there any type of therapeutic treatment? Was there any type of diagnostic procedure? Did it extend the LOS? Did it increase nursing care? Now, you have to think these things through. Some things are going to always in, uh, increase nursing care, even though the physician doesn't say it. There's going to be things going to affect how he treats the patient, even though he doesn't say it. The physician is not going to write for us, hey, this patient got hypertension. Therefore, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. You as a coder have to know that if a patient has hypertension, they're going to be treated differently from somebody that do not. So hypertension is always going to be a diagnosis, especially when they're on medication, that you're going to code. COPD is the same thing. Somebody got COPD? Oh, yeah, they're going to be treated differently. See? And don't let them have COPD and they're on oxygen. Somebody got to give them the oxygen. See what I'm saying? Oh, I, used, I hate that when people say that. See what I'm saying? Sorry about that. Because you may not see what I'm saying. Because maybe you don't code. Now, there are some things that, like I said, the physician, maybe the physician said, well, I, I think the patient have a UTI. Suspected UTI. Now, this is where we get into trouble with these suspected condition as inpatient coder. So he suspected the patient have a UTI. What did he do other than order a lab? All he did was order a lab, and the lab came back negative. Guess what, people? They didn't have a UTI. You don't need to send a query. It's not supported. He didn't do any IV. He didn't do any antibodies or our IV. It was negative, so he didn't come back and say UTI ruled out. You get paid to know it was ruled out. Say, so. All righty. Some things are going to extend the LOS. A lot of times the physician will uh, tell you that. So always when you want to code those secondary diagnoses, think about these what, five things. Clinical evaluation, therapeutic treatment, diagnostic procedure, extend the LOS, increase nursing care. There's a lot of things going to increase nursing care. They're not going to tell you that. If somebody is blind, guess what? It's going to increase nursing care. Somebody got to feed the patient. Somebody got to make sure they don't fall out of bed. See, you got a pregnant woman come in with pneumonia, guess what? That pregnancy is going to change the whole way they treat it. See, you don't have to go back and say, oh, I need to ask the physician. That's why physicians are upset. We are querying them to death. I was thinking about uh, writing a blog saying, physician death by query. Come on, people. 
We got to see. But anyway, this is Mary Gregory signing off for the day. Those are your CCS, CCS tips. I hope you take those and utilize them and help them to uh, pass that test. Uh, we got a website, www.mascodingsolutions.com. It's currently on the construction. It should be back up in uh, June, uh, the end of June, first part of July. We got Facebook. We got LinkedIn. We have Twitter. We got Instagram. We got all those things. Hit me up sometime. Uh, I appreciate all the people that do he, uh, hit me up and say, oh, we enjoyed that video. It was such a great video. Thank you. I don't take anything for granted because you know what? You can, it's so many videos out there on coding. And if you choose to watch mine, I appreciate that. And so I am looking forward to, I may not know you personally, but I want you to be very successful. And I want you to get your CCS. I want you to succeed. You know why? Because I know that this is a career that can change your life forever. Talk to you later.